Hello, everyone. Welcome. As you're coming in, please uh, let us know where you're tuning in from. We'd like to, we always like to know where everyone's coming from. Some, most of the time we have people from Connecticut, but uh, sometimes we have people from all over the place. So uh, yeah, if you could in the chat, tell us where you're tuning in from and what brought you here today. Um, and as soon as we have everyone here, which will be fairly soon, I will start with my introduction. Um, I'm tuning in from East Hartford. Um, so not quite at the Mark Twain house this evening. It's all locked up tight and safe. Um, but yeah, if you can tell me where you're coming in from. Uh, we have, it looks like we have someone from Farmington, someone from Orland Park, Illinois, East Woodstock. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and get started as you all are uh, telling us where you're tuning in from. Um, hello, um, welcome or welcome back. I'm Omar Acevedo and I'm the literary program coordinator at the Mark Twain House and Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. And I'm delighted to host tonight's program, Status Revolution, the Improbable Story of How the Lowbrow Became the Highbrow. Our virtual programs are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are happy to honor his memory with these programs. We are also incredibly grateful to the Wish You Well Foundation and Connecticut Public WNPR for supporting all our virtual programs. And thanks to those of you uh, who have donated. Um, if you haven't, uh, please donate. Um, I will drop a link into the chat um, so you can donate. Um, any small amount is really awesome. Um, just like NPR says, anything um, that you're willing to donate is, is, um, is going towards the museum and, and, and our programs. Um, anything will help. Um, so now let me tell you more about tonight's program. We are welcoming uh, Chuck Thompson and Henry Alford for a discussion of Chuck's book, Status Revolution. This new book explains why everything we know about status is changing, upends centuries of conventional wisdom, and shows how the new status revolution reflects our place in contemporary society. I actually have it right here. I'm gonna hold it up so you can see, hopefully. I have a, uh, I have a fake background, so these aren't real books, but. Here's, here's the book, <laughs> you can kind of see it there. Um, I'm sure uh, Henry or Chuck will hold it up at some point. Um, so uh, now to introductions uh, for our guests. Our author, Chuck Thompson, is the author of the widely reviewed political screed, Better Off Without Him, a Northern Manifesto for Southern uh, Secession. He's a creator, writer, and executive and an executive producer of the Paramount Plus documentary, Sometimes When We Touch, The Rain, Ruin, and Resurrection of Soft Rock. His writing has appeared in Politico, The New Republic, and many other uh, publications. Our moderator, Henry Alford, is a journalist and humorist. He is also the author of six books, including How to Live and Big Kiss, which won the Thurber Prize for American Humor Award. He writes for the New Yorker. Um, and finally, we encourage you to have a conversation in the chat. If you have a specific question, you can post that directly into our Q&A section. You can do that at any time. As soon as it pops into your head, put it right into the Q&A. Um, please also note that you can click on live transcript to see live auto captioning of this event, um, which I have not turned on for myself, actually. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. Um, I will be putting a link in the chat to purchase uh, uh, Status Revolution through our museum store. Um, that is also a great chance to support the museum, um, buying it through our store. Um, and we would, uh, once we receive that, we'll get it out to you um, as soon as possible. So that is all from me. Uh, please sit back and enjoy. And I will turn this over to Chuck and Henry. Gotta spotlight these guys, just one moment, please.
Hello. Can you see me, Chuck? I can see you. I can see you and I can hear you. So I beautiful. Think okay. Are intact. Look we'll at just, that. We'll assume that others can see and hear us. We'll assume, yes, that our bon ami is is available to everyone. Um, well, I'm so thrilled to be here to talk about Chuck's new book for those who didn't see it when Omar was holding it up. Um, you know, it occurs to me that in days of yore, status seeking was um, uh, considered a, a sign of moral weakness. Um, but obviously today it's a whole new ball game. We're, we're constantly bombarded by opportunities to to uh, to grab a little status or prestige. Um, and moreover, things that are considered statusy or prestigious are are much wider. There, there's a, a, a much bigger um, uh, category there. Um, so why don't we start, Chuck, with want to tell us what inspired you to write the book? Well, the, the book was initially um, suggested to me by my publisher, Simon Schuster, John Carp. And at first I was kind of skeptical about doing it. I'm not particularly a guy who's been um, interested or consumed with ideas of status and prestige and luxury. Um, I never watched MTV Cribs. I, I don't go jewelry shopping on vacation, you know, and, and that sort of thing. It's just never interested me that much. But I think that's in a way why um, he wanted me to do it. And, and so I said, okay, well, let me look into this topic for a few months and see what happens. And the first thing I was really taken by was there's just a heck of a lot going on in the world of status right now in terms of studying it, in terms of changing the way that it's being commuted to us as a society. I mean, in my view, pretty quickly came around to the view that, you know, our, our collective views of status are undergoing probably their biggest convulsion since the Industrial Revolution. And that's when a guy named Thorstein Veblen, um, you know, wrote about status seekers and uh, the luxury uh, class or the, um, why am I suddenly blanking on his book right now, but it's, it's the most famous, the Touchstone book, right? It was written in 1899. Uh, the Theory of the Leisure Class, I think. Oh my God. So, thank you for doing this prep that I did and then suddenly forgot. I need to, I, very quick, I'm going to digress quickly to tell you, I have a confession. I should have, you know, you write these books and they're, they're done for like six months really before they come out. And I should have spent the time prepping for this interview, kind of reviewing my own book. And then I would have had that book title top of my head. But instead I prepared by um, review, reading your book and then we danced, which is so good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have a question, I'll hold up your book. <laughs> it's so funny. So anyway, but <clears throat> so for sure, like everybody from, from Veblen to Vance Packard, who's a name that people might recognize, he kind of wrote, the, he wrote this book called The Status Seekers in the 1950s and he was this big social critic. I mean, go back to Grandma Moses, and and everybody is kind of um, casting, the framing status of the consumer age as something malign, or as you said, morally deficient, right? That, that but the, the big takeaway for me is that status and status seeking are no longer a sin, or the people that are really leading this revolution are framing it that way. And there, there's several reasons for that. And one of them is that really status seeking, is, it's no longer sin, it's biology. There's a guy down at Caltech named Stephen Quartz, who's uh, doing a lot of research into looking at, um, you know, Quartz and others have done studies where they look into people's brains using fMRI, right? Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging. I think I got that one right. At the exact moment that they're consuming status or, or luxury products, say an expensive bottle of wine. And, there's, and they're seeing that when people are doing that, when they think that they are experiencing status or privilege or prestige, there's this huge flood of dopamine goes into the brain that, that gives pleasure, right? It's kind of the pleasure drug and floods the pleasure centers of the brain and, and tells us that we're having a great experience. The, the, uh, and, and so this is what I mean when I say it's no longer sin, it's biology, right? A guy like Thorstein Veblen or, or Vance Packer didn't have this research, this technology available to them. They couldn't really tell that 
they just thought they were kind of basing most of their assumptions in these kind of retrograde Victorian ethos and and the church, which is, you know, um, counseling against, you know, consumerism and greed and acquisition of products. And so with technology like that, and I'll tell you one real quick, this is probably a long-winded answer, but the one uh, study that I really like that I reference in the book, which wasn't Quartz's, but it took place at Caltech. It's a woman named Hilke Plasman. She gave people, um, she did study with wine, Cabernet, and she gave these test subjects uh, three bottles of wine and said, I'm going to have you drink this $5 bottle of cab that we picked up at Trader Joe's down the street. Then we have you try this $30 bottle of wine from a wine shop. And then we've got this really $150, $200 bottle of just really great wine that we'd like you to taste. And she, you know, in in the great way that these uh, social studies are kind of a ruse, you know, she said, we, we want to test people's digestion or some sort of, you know, stupid ruse to, to get them off the scent. Anyway, what was really happening was she was giving these people the exact same wine. So Henry, let's say you're a, a test subject in her, in her study. Here's this $5 bottle of wine. Now she's watching because you're hooked up to this fMRI. And your brain's like, eh, okay, fine. Then you get the $200 bottle of wine, which is the exact same bottle of wine. Yeah. It's going bananas. Your brain's going bonkers. So the takeaway here is that people really do enjoy expensive wine more than they do cheap wine. Maybe not for the reasons that you want to think. Maybe it's not the taste or the texture or the history of it. It's because they feel they're experiencing luxury and prestige and they've got some piece of status. And that really makes people happy. And so it's it's things like this that are really pushing what we I'm calling the status revolution. There are other factors as well. Um, and also it's remarkable that not only are people um, responding to signs of prestige more uh, readily, but they're also talking about it more, right? I mean, one of the one of the um, uh, the opening of your book is um, about rescue dogs and this idea that, uh, which resonated with me, that so many people now l- like to brag about having rescued a dog, whereas they're a little sheepish about their purebred. Um, and in fact, now we even have a, a, a new word for this, virtue signaling, um, this idea that people like to blab about um you know they're they're supposedly or or indeed noble acts yeah it's true i i i started on that rescue dogs chapter it's really funny how these things happen i just wanted to find out where that term rescue dog started and when it got into popular parlance it was just like a sort of a one off little thing i was doing a little fact checking and in the course of that um uh, research I came upon this woman named Kim Sterla, who's a woman who the, the chap, first chapter title of the book is The Woman Who Invented Rescue Dogs, which is a little bit you know, of a joke. I mean, no one invented the rescue dog, but as much as anybody, she did. And she really tapped into this virtue signaling in the 90s. She was down at the Marin Humane Society in the California Bay Area. And she, she really came up with this method of, although she told me, accidentally or maybe not even consciously kind of linking the promotions around getting people to rescue dogs to um, some of the just pillars of luxury marketing that come out of luxury marketing books and that's where a lot of virtue signaling comes out of so when you talk about different ways that people are looking at status i mean that's one of them for sure when we've all seen our society convulsed over the last two or three or four or five years. And the whole idea of privilege, often um, prefaced with the words white privilege or even white male privilege, but just privilege in general is under a lot of scrutiny. Who has it in a society? Why do they have it? How did they get it? How can I get some? How can we make this prestige or this privilege thing more equitable, right? And so a lot of that is driving this conversation as well. And, and that's, rescue dogs that's turned into real quickly my, I thought, well, rescue dogs are kind of an interesting way to look at status because 50 years ago, they were just mutts and Heinz 57s and, 
you know, pound dogs, right? The dog catcher, they had no status in the dog world. So I thought that <laughs> looking at how they've risen in status in the dog world, it might kind of remove um, some of the stigma and some of the volatility around these discussions of social status and, and you know, prejudice or privilege and things like that. Yeah, no, and I think it's a, it's a very 2023 20, concept, as is this idea that status obviously is no longer the province of white men, that, that inclusivity has had a, um, a big role here in sort of democratizing what, what is considered um, prestigious. Um, can you talk a little bit about a, a chapter that I really liked in the book was um, the uh, indigenous craftsman uh, in British Columbia who is using, who's carving totem poles to create communal status? Yeah, you're referring to a First Nations artist um, named Roy Vickers, who's out in British Columbia. He's really well known in BC, but also across Canada. I noticed somebody coming in was from Calgary, so possibly they've got some familiarity with, with Roy Vickers. But he's in his 70s now, and he's been an artist who has done paintings and sculpture and totem poles for all variety of things, Commonwealth Games. And when the Olympics were in Vancouver, he did a lot of art. Some of his art's been given to the Queen of England um, before she passed away as these sort of state gifts. I and mean, he's at that level. Um, when I met Roy, he was engaged in what he called the biggest project of his life, which was to carve an exact replica of a totem pole that had been taken from his village, uh, his ancestral village, he wasn't alive at the time, um, by this thing called the British Columbia Totem Pole Preservation Committee, which had run around the province and literally removed totem poles from uh, First Nations villages and took them back to Vancouver and Victoria to put them in museums. The idea being that we're going to salvage what remains of these First Nations cultures uh, before they disappear. That's what the preservation, the, the university and the logging companies at Bankroll that called it salvage and prepper, preservation. The First Nations villages called it theft, right? <laughs> these guys come in and say, well, you don't need this totem pole anymore. You know, it's kind of illegal anyway, thanks to the Indian acts that we passed and your culture is kind of, um, you know, not not entirely legal any longer to the point that you can't even speak your language. So we're going to take these totem poles and keep them in a museum. As Roy's gotten older, he's gotten really unhappy with this. He saw this this totem pole that was taken from this village called the Wicano on the BC coast. Quite became quite well known, one of the most famous totem poles in the whole Pacific Northwest. It was a very unique design with his large bill and all this stuff. So he has had gone on this big mission to carve a replica rather than bring the old totem pole back to the village, which had suffered a lot of degradation over the years and probably would have rotted away. He went out to search for like a 500, 800 year old cedar tree, get it felled with the cooperation of uh, Interfor, which is a big uh, Canadian logging firm and proceeded to carve this totem pole and then take it back to this village of Awikano and erect it in the middle of the village and have a potlatch around that, a big ceremony. And, you know, when I first went out to cover that story for Outside Magazine, I just assumed, well, I'm gonna be writing about art and history. I'll be writing a story about totem poles. But it became evident to me pretty quickly, I was actually gonna be writing a story about status and the return of status to this First Nations society through, um, you know, Canada's going through its big reconciliation process and all of these other things that it's attempting to do at a governmental level to atone for its, you know, crimes against First Nations and to restore some level of status to those communities. But nothing did that more powerfully than Roy raising that totem pole, Roy and others raising that pole in, back in that village. And I was really lucky enough to be part, you know, he invited me to, I, I met him by chance when he was just starting to do the carving. He'd already acquired the the tree. And I met with him several times, hung out at his place for a week or two at a time. And then he invited uh, my wife and I back to the potlatch and the pole raising when it actually occurred. And it was, it was an incredible event. I bet. That sounds spectacular. Um, now, of course, though, the discussion of totem poles leads me to a slightly different topic though though somehow related um which is your very 
heroic efforts to determine whether or not men with small penises buy sports cars in order to compensate? Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wanted to mix in a little bit of levity with, <laughs> with the totem poles and the uh, First Nations history in Canada and this country as well. Um, one of the things that struck me about the way that we think collectively about status is this huge academic machine that is behind studying status. I, I mentioned um, Stephen Quartz at Caltech. Um, there's some guys at University College London I did some work with. I mean, there's just uh, one of the first, uh, and I'll get to the penises and sports cars momentarily and, and the way that Greta Thunberg sort of inadvertently has helped publicize the book. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I was gonna say there's a woman named Sylvia Beleza out at Columbia University who is studying the way that leisure no longer necessarily commutes an idea of status, that, that even, even really rich people are working all the time, hustling all the time, right? And in talking to her, you know, she told me there's probably at any given time at Columbia University alone, 20 to 25, you know, graduate students or professors working on um, studies and research, status, how the brain's processing. You know, there, there's just a lot of activity in this area academically. So I kind of wanted to know how that worked. And so I decided to commission a study. And I commissioned a study on that old joke of guys with guys who buy sports cars are doing so to compensate for what they might perceive as smaller than average penis size, um, which was meant to be kind of funny and a lighthearted way to get into this, but it's a serious study. I mean, we got grad students to help us out. We pulled in some other professors. The study has been last week submitted to a very respected academic journal for um, these kind of things. And, you know, I just wanted to see, okay, how would you find this out if this is really a marker of prestige, if, if um, you know, guys certainly worry about their genitalia, the, the penis is the most Googled part of the body on all <laughs> Google searches, right? It's something that guys are quite, you know, concerned with in terms of status. So, so we did this study, we got, um, you know, one of the things I found that was pretty interesting, all of the grad students that um, signed up to, to help us with this, there were three of them eventually chosen and got credit for this at University College London, were women. And there are women from three different countries. And, you know, we used the tools like, you know, um, Google Trends. And I mean, there are all sorts of kind of, um, you know, data sets are so easy to capture globally now using all these online tools. You can do an online survey of 500 people in different cultures and countries in a, in a day, in a, in, a, in a couple of days. And then you can use some program to analyze all the data for you and give you 30 conclusions, right? When this guy, Henri Tosh, was a sociologist at, um, in the UK, and he did this very famous study about group dynamics and how pressure works and you know how people respond when they might be an outlier in the group, but they find out that most of the people in the group have another opinion, they'll kind of come around and he based his entire conclusions on a group of schoolboys, uh, aged like 13 to 15, in, at a single school in Bristol, England. It's a nice study. It's very famous. It's been cited all over the place millions of times. But he's basing an entire assumption for the whole world on, on you know, a one class of boys in Bristol, England. I think I might have said Bristol, Connecticut, but it's Bristol. England. Well, now and with our study, and with every, all these studies. That's no longer the case. I can sit in my bedroom in Portland, Oregon, or a university professor down at his office in Tucson or his bedroom in Boston during COVID and sample the freaking world. And in our study, we got respondents from, I think, 16 countries, you know, obviously the US, UK, Canada, South Korea, Japan, Mexico, Rome, Turkey, um, all of Australia. So I feel like in that way, our, our data is a lot more valid um, than it might have been. And as well, we had three women from different countries guiding the study, giving us their input. So their perspectives are part of that study as well. Now, that just so you know, that chapter, you know, was, it was a little dicey. I knew and my editor knew that including a chapter that looks at, you know, dick size and sports cars was going to open me up to a little bit of criticism of, oh, uh, what a, you know, this is guy serious. What a joke. You know, we can't take this seriously. But 
I did enjoy when Greta Thunberg came out about two weeks ago, right? When that internet troll trolled her about his sports car. Hey, I got 35 sports cars and tell me about your recycling plan, honey, or whatever his, you know, bad tweet was. And she fires back something, get a life at, you know, tell me all about it. You know, respond to me at get a life at small dick energy. That was her, something like that. You know, I'm paraphrasing. So to me, that kind of validated that study a little bit. <laughs> it, it was frivolous, but the other thing, Henry, I just kind of try, try to destigmatize this this um, topic. You know, most of the books about status that are out there are by university professors. They're 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 lucid and they're well researched and they're really well written. And they're kind of dry. They're kind of textbooks. You know, you'd have them for a class. And I didn't want to write a, a book that would would show up in a college class. Yeah, no, no, no. And that's, that's why that is that episode is is so winning. Um, and no, it's interesting that you do, um, you describe this kind of um, status industry almost that there are all these academics and their journals and their consortiums and their think tanks, who are dedicated to this topic. Um, one of the counterintuitive things that came out of that discussion for me was at one point you list um, the seven laws of luxury marketing, most of which are very reasonable. Things like create an emotional experience, demark yourself from the competition, et cetera, et cetera. But the one that I that that surprised me was accentuate the flaws. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? For sure. And those laws come from this book. And I, the one book I had ready to hold up, this is kind of, if you're in the luxury industry and you're trying to sell luxury to people, whether it's cars or jewelry, it's this book called The Luxury Strategy by a couple of um, French luxury marketers who worked with, if, you, if there's been a overpriced luxury brand from Europe, they've probably been involved in its marketing campaigns. Jean-Noël Kepfer and uh, Vincent Bastien. And they outlined these things. And, and man, that, that book really is, I talked to everybody, everybody, the first book, they said, you got to read luxury strategy, got to read luxury strategy. So the flaws part is interesting. Um, think about, I guess, um, watches, which are, are called, they're called timepieces, if they're very expensive. Um, you know, if you get a luxury timepiece, $5,000, $10,000 watch, one of the first things you'll be told is that it does not keep precise time, that it's going to lose or gain a minute or 40 seconds every six months. And that that is part of, that's how you know it's this handcrafted thing. And that's part of a legacy of watches from this little shop that's been going on for 600 years. Now they'll say the Seiko watch or the, the digital watch from, you know, um, Samsung or whatever, that's going to keep perfect military time. If that's what you want, go get your $14 watch and be right on the second. But for people who can afford $20,000 for a watch, and that's actually cheap for some of these watches, um, you don't need to know exactly what second, you know, you can afford to be hit five minutes late. They're going to be waiting on you. Um, you know, the other one is um, it's British sports cars, right, are famed among sports car collectors, right? Jaguars and old MG midgets and stuff. I mean, they're completely janky vehicles, right? They're breaking down all the time, but that's kind of part of the, the charm and the, and the, again, the way you know that this is a human thing, that somebody was sitting in a garage doing this for you. This wasn't slapped together, um, mass produced by, you know, machines and things like that. So those right. are kind of two classic examples of the way flaws are embraced by the luxury community. Great, yeah. Um, and then you also kind of go big picture in the book and talk about charitable giving um, with this idea that charitable giving is costing the country, is costing taxpayers something like $50 billion a year. Um, I'd love to hear more about that and sort of and how it um, how that connects to college football. <laughs> um, yes, I can do that. So, <laughs> for, I mean, philanthropy in general for a lot of people is just thought of well, here's a here's a person who has a lot of money and they're benevolent enough they're going to give away a bunch of their money to do some good for people, you know, help hungry people or give toys to children at Christmas or something. In fact, that accounts for maybe, maybe five, 10% of the kind of 
philanthropic activity that goes on in the United States. Philanthropy is essentially a tax dodge for really wealthy people, entirely, 100%. And there's been many books and studies and people will talk to you about this for on and on. It's basically a tax code dodge. And, and, and so in a way, philanthropy becomes one of the big ways that the ultra wealthy signal status to each other. We all know about one of the points I make in them that are very, a, a guy who I know and tells me he's comfortably within the top 1%, you know, that 1% of the one percentile. And he says, well, you can look at your luxury yachts and your private jets, and all the country clubs. He goes, the, there's two ways that the ultra rich really signal status to each other. And one is with buildings, getting your name on a building, right? <laughs> a concert hall, a cancer research center, a library. And the other is with uh, how little taxes you can pay, right? And, and the way you don't pay taxes is you give away um, a lot of money to things that you want to support, like your elite prep school, or you know uh, that your son and daughter might go to, or to, for example, a, a really great tax dodge that I learned about, uh, particularly I guess prevalent in the Northeast was there's these families that might be sitting on a hundred acres of land, right? They're paying taxes, little tax, and then their their homes or whatever occupy, you know, whatever quarter acre of that land. They will donate ninety five acres of their hundred acres to a, to become a nature preserve that will be now will, will not be undeveloped. It will be for waterfowl or fish or something like this if they have a lake on the property, and there'll be barriers around it, and so nobody can access that. Suddenly, they've given that thing away. They've it's now it's now they don't own it. They set up a court, they set up a foundation that that they run themselves or that they appoint, you know, their family runs. 95 acres are taken off the tax rolls. Nobody can encroach on their space just like before. They run the foundation that controls the thing. And so they save all that money. That's just that's one, that's one way to do it. But the other way really that, that's more common is to, you know, just just influence things you want to influence. And the way you, you brought up college football. And a lot, not a lot of people know it, but um, virtually all college football bowl games are non-profit, operated as non-profit institutions, the same way that Habitat for Humanity or uh, the Humane Society, right? As we all know, college football bowl games are unbelievable revenue generators to the point that, is it the it's either the Fiesta Bowl or the Orange Bowl? I mean, the, the CEOs of these bowls make $500,000 plus in salary. Uh, a couple of them make a million plus. For, for overseeing one football game a year, they'll draw a salary of a million dollars plus. Meanwhile, you know, ESPN, which basically owns all bowl games now, sells billions of dollars of ads on it, and, and nobody pays taxes because it's a charity. It's a charity. And the charity of the, of, the, of the Sugar Bowl or the, you know, whatever, Fiesta Bowl or whatever bowl it is, they'll, they'll donate money to causes that rich people want to support that tend to reinforce their status, right? They'll, they'll, they'll donate it to nature preserves or to schools that elite people can go to. And in that way, they, they uh, reinforce their position of status within the society and rob untold billions um, from tax rolls. And they, right. get to and they get to decide where the money, even if they're spending on good causes, it's they get to decide where the money goes, not, not our elected officials, right? And some of the causes that very wealthy people um, support might be very good. They might be to, you know, feed hunger or, you know, Bill Gates, we know, does a lot of great work with, you know, cures of malaria and tropical disease, other kind of things. Nevertheless, is it right that that, you know, he gets to decide where our tax dollars are being diverted, not us or our elected officials? Right. And as you point out, it, it is funny how so many of these billionaires um, like to eat at McDonald's or... Um, who was the, uh, was it Mitt Romney, well, head of Bain, was uh, driving a, a, a dented. Uh, it was like a free classic or what? Yeah, like an all, right, a junk, not a junker, but. Right, like, yeah. From that. Right. A humble um, little car, yeah. But, you know, um, just since you brought this up, I have to say, I didn't, I did in that chapter for sure. I went and visited with the patriotic millionaires and others. But I really did try for the most part in this book to, I wasn't focusing on the uber wealthy and the lifestyles of the rich and famous, which was, I hated that goddamn show when I was a kid and I just, just didn't care. 
And I didn't want to write about that. It just doesn't interest yeah. me. No, that's kind of, that stuff is sort of fish in a barrel. Um, what, something that was interesting for those of us who have read other Chuck Thompson books is you are much less profane in this book. Um, one wondered, um, has Chuck grown up or <laughs> is Chuck trying to be classy given the, the topic? What, what's going on? Well, I'm not sure I like how you say trying to be classy. <laughs> Are you classy? Um, well, yeah, you know what? That was a conscious decision I made. I have um, tended in other books to rely on I'm no stranger to profanity and I don't mind it. I like a good, well-placed, you know, motherfucker and whatever, you know, joke. And, um, but I do recognize that those are kind of, can be sort of taken as cheap laughs, right? And and when you get maybe, I, maybe in the past, I probably used them a little too much. I had an uncle who died recently. He's down in Southern California. And he's one of the most literate and well-read people I know. And he, he sent me several notes over the years saying, Boy, your writing would be so much better if you just didn't, you know, you didn't have to swear so much in it. And I was like, well, you know, and I really liked Uncle Bob. So I thought about that a little bit. And, you know, I am trying to, in the last book I did, Better Off Without Him, which was this um, book about the South, you know, from this sort of Northern liberal, uber over the top liberal perspective. Um, I put a, a lot of research on that book and I really felt there were some important points to make. And in Reading that book back, I kind of wondered if I was undermining some of the more um, um, important or serious points I was trying to make by, you know, having maybe too much profanity or cheap jokes surrounding them. So I did try, I did definitely try to dial that back in this book. Now, whether that works or not, I don't know, but um, yeah. No, so I think it, rather no, than I, grow, can I say evolving rather than growing up? Because I. <laughs> Yes, like, and I apologize. Oh, I didn't mean I didn't mean that question to be a no, no. a diss I, by any no, means. It wasn't, it wasn't. Um, no, I think it's a really good um, mix of um, sort of witty, voice-driven writing, and uh, yeah, and sort of and a scholarly approach to the topic. Um, and as I say, to me, what really made it. You know, the status is such a slippery topic to write about. It's so elusive. So for me, the fact that you went up to British Columbia and talked to that um, totem pole carver, or the fact that you went to D.C. and hung out with the millionaires, um, or you went to Italy and talked to that guy, um, that gives it a uh yeah kind of a nice universe uh, a, a global approach um and now i'm realizing we didn't talk about that guy in italy want to want to tell us what that was about yeah uh there's a gentleman named paolo scudieri whose nickname is the king of comfort and he uh runs a company called the adler pelzer group which very few people have probably heard of but they design and manufacture car interiors uh, they're kind of a third party that will do the, the seats for BMW or Ferrari. And they got started with Ferrari and these brands that are um, kind of with super luxury, right? Bentley and Lamborghini and Ferrari and Mercedes-Benz, really high-end vehicles. Um, so Paolo Scudieri and his company design luxury car interiors. That's what they're known for. And uh, Scudieri himself grew up definitely not poor, but in Southern Italy and a guy who was by his um, birth in Southern Italy, sort of kept out of the of the sort of poshy posh Northern Italian luxury car market, which he was trying to break into and which he eventually did. But a lot of the story of um, Scudieri is how he overcame his perceived lack of status in order to kind of take over one of the most, you know, I mean, there's there are few things that, you um, that symbolize luxury and prestige and status in this world still than a really expensive car. Um, car culture is waning a little bit, but it's still pretty important for, you know, right? If, if, your, if your lawyer shows up in his Ford Fiesta and the other guy's lawyer shows up in his whatever Audi 600 series or BMW, I don't know those things, but you, you know which guys make a lot more money, right? Or which ones make a lot more money. Um, 
But, you know, to get back to that one point, I, want, I was going to ask you something, Henry, because I do spend some time thinking about this balance between humor and sort of serious scholarship. And my whole approach has always been to kind of try to do both, like make this serious, do this serious scholarship, do this work, but try to be kind of lighthearted or funny and entertaining and keep people moving through it. And I, I think it's a kind of a hard dance. And I think for a lot of writers, they never quite find it. And a lot of people, if you make jokes, they're not going to take you too seriously. And if you get, get too serious, they don't want to hear your jokes. I think you're a guy who's really done a great job of that. I mean, your books definitely have a lot of serious research in them. You go do this stuff, right? Whether it's your book on manners or dancing or whatever. Um, and yet they're really fun. They're lighthearted books. So, I mean, do you think about that or how do you, how do you kind of achieve that? I do think about that all the time. Um, I guess it, it, my thinking is that you don't want to make your points as you don't want to make jokes be the point. Um, whereas you want as much voice and as much charm while delivering the serious point, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that the punchline should never be the 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 argument. I think it should be the um, uh, it should be the car that the argument drives in on. Yeah, you know, and it just occurred to me while you were saying that maybe that's how what I came around to in terms of profanity, because because as soon as you throw in one of those big four letter words, it kind of does overwhelm everything else. It kind of becomes it feels like it becomes the point, even if it's not intended that way. Yeah, it can. And you have to be very, yeah, very, very judicious and careful. And yeah, I think I think a book can handle two F-bombs. You know, <laughs> to me, that seems like that's about the right amount. After that, they're just not as exciting. Yeah. I think I have about six in this one, but that's yeah. down from about 259. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so let's take some questions. I have the Q&A thing open. Here's one. <clears throat> have you seen a generational difference in how status is perceived, or is it more of a broader cultural change? I Yes, yes is the answer. And I think we're, I'm going to do kind of quick answers. Is there a few answers, Paula? Because, you know, I hate to. Yeah, we've got four or five questions. Okay. So yes, and I think we're just kind of at the very beginning of this change in how society is going to view status. Um, you know, I think just our whole relationship, I, I don't want to sound too naive here. I, I think that society's relationship with money is kind of in the very early parts of changing. Um, I mean, cryptocurrency has stuff to do with that. There's all sorts of places that are important. Why do we take my cash anymore, right? It's really weird. I, it, that's a generational thing for me. I can't stand going to a place and buying a smoothie and here's 10 bucks, and they, they won't even take my cash. So I do think things like that are happening generationally. And I do understand that that marks me out as a person who's not, you know, who's, God damn it, take my cash. Um, so yeah, and obviously things like, you know, social media and all sorts of apps, you know, DoorDash and TaskRabbit, these things provide services that heretofore were provided by minions to millionaires, right? Go out and do, I mean, holy cow, it's it's amazing. So yes, I do think it's a generational thing for sure. And that is addressed in the book. Here's another one. I would love to hear your thoughts or impressions about status as it applies to the increasing number of men as primary caregivers and homemakers. I belong to the National At Home Dad Network, which has been supporting and promoting men in this role for many years. The reactions we get are often mixed from effusive praise for doing work women have been doing for all of history without any praise to sneers and jeers from people who think it's low status work beneath the dignity of a real man. I've heard all sorts of studies, reports, and theories on this from gender or class perspectives, but never from status. I have not considered that. I'll say that. It's really interesting. I tend yeah, to not it's a great like question. To, to, yeah, it's a really good question. And I and I'll get to it, but I have to say, I feel like most writers become writers because they're you know that that thing where, oh, I should have said it's like when someone you're at a party and there's a thing somebody says, and then you think of the perfect response a day later. And 
that's kind of how I am. I mean, I'm not really good at thinking things through right off the cuff. I like to sit down and read some books and take a shower and think about it in the shower and then go, oh, I got it. <laughs> but I, I would assume, I mean, that that probably fits into a narrative of, I mean, clearly, I have, a, I have, um, I don't know if this answers the question. I'm sorry if it doesn't, but there's a, was a really interesting thing when I was um, reading about um, universities and university faculty. Um, and particularly about sociology and how women have come to really be drivers of sociology departments and universities, which are ways that really convey our attitudes about things like status. And in 1971, there were no women at all on the American Sociological Association's 11 member executive committee, not one. Today, the, the ASA's 2023 executive committee, every single member is a woman. And on the 11 member finance committee of that group, there are no white men, there's one male, it's not a white male, and all the rest are women. And so clearly within academics, soci sociology academics, and particularly in this example, the status of women is just, it's, it's, it's totally in one or two generations, it's gone from non non-existent to running the whole show. And now there are still there are still problems in terms of pay and tenure, and, and there are gender gaps. And I'm not saying that it's a completely equal and perfect world yet, but clearly that trend um, for for women have elevated status in that regard is, is undeniable. Yeah. No. Exactly. I, I will say this about the the I forget the name of the group uh, that the the guy was talking about men who stay home taking care of children, um, house fathers perhaps. Um, the one thing I really like about this status revolution, at least the way I see it, is that it's not a zero sum game, that people are no longer assuming that just because I have status, that means you don't have as much. Or if I gain status, that means somebody else has to lose it. To the status revolution, as I've seen it in the way I write about it in the book, it's a, it's a rising tide lifts all boats. It's a peaceful revolution and it's a good news revolution because it doesn't mean that, you know, remember that couple in St. Louis waving their guns at those pro to social justice protesters in St. Louis. And I, I kind of think of them as the illustration of this and, and the way that those guys are really getting it wrong. Just because those protesters wanted elevated status, wanted privilege, doesn't mean that you have to lose yours. We can all do this together. And I think that's a really fundamental message of the status revolution. So I think as time goes on, you'll hear fewer and fewer of those jeers and people who are criticizing you for staying home doing the important work of raising children. Yeah, I agree with you. And, and I think that um, to that point that, um, it, it, that there's kind of a larger frame now of, of looking at status, um, which is to say someone like Thorstein Veblen was clearly not thinking about the impoverished, but surely in the ghetto, there are status symbols. Um, and so that's a part of this, this movement towards inclusivity is now I think that we're realizing, oh, well, you know, a pair of $500 basketball sneakers in some, in some uh, neighborhoods, in some contexts, that is a huge status symbol. Um, it may not be in, in other ones, but, um, but it, it is for some people. So yeah, I think the bigger the frame, the 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 more um, uh, the more democratic this idea of of you know status gets. We were I was talking with this uh, sociologist at the New School named uh, Rachel Sherman. I read about a little bit her in the book. I really liked her. She's written some great books. And I was talking to her about Thorsten Veblen and and the fact that he based his very famous conclusions on almost no research. He cited no studies. He did no, and she kind of uh, nodded. And then I just found her quote, because as I included in the book, she said, the early moments of social study, there was sometimes not a huge difference between social science and telepathy. It's a lot of white men talking out of their ass. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and by the way, I, I find some of those white men talking about it are still pretty entertaining and some of them made good points. But the bigger point is that there's a lot more voices involved and that's only for the good, right? Yeah. And, and I do think, again, it's, we're just at the start of this thing. Here's another question. What about the trend of dressing down as a status symbol? I noticed that around the year 2000, the internet millionaires began wearing t-shirts and jeans rather than suits or blazers and slacks. 
I believe the term for that is counter signaling. And absolutely, and I write about this in the book, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's total trend and it, it comes from a couple of places. Um, one, it comes from a lot of the people who became very wealthy and influential in our society had their roots in the 1960s and 70s and the sort of hippie um, ethos of not selling out to the man and not becoming this uh, symbol of authority in the establishment. Well, now that they have become the authority in the establishment and now that they have become the man, they still sort of carry in a fashion sense these old ethos of that's not really me. It might really be them, but they don't really want to they don't want to signal that to the world for one thing because it's associated with these kind of curmudgeon wasps of the you know 30s and 40s and 50s sitting around with their prominent chins making uh, you know, declarations about the plebes. But the other thing is they don't they just don't have to anymore because again I think there's there's this idea that luxury is becoming democratized and that status is becoming democratized. If you talk to any status marketer, there's this term they all throw around now. It says status is for everyone. And it sounds like total BS. How could status be for everyone? I mean, by its very definition, right? Status and prestige or whatever is meant to separate the prized from the insignificant. Um, but this is the rallying cry for luxury marketers now that we're, we're all going to be a part of this now. And presumably a lot of this stuff is gonna change, right? Like as with this question about dressing down, uh, if, I remember if you go back to the 90s, you know, the very um, height of status in New York was people who didn't, who don't wear outerwear during the winter, even if it's snowing, because that's someone whose car is picking him up at his home and then <laughs> taking him to the office. And he never has, that person never has to go outdoors. Um, and, you know, and then, yeah, 20 years later, then suddenly we had Mark Zuckerberg in bare feet and a hoodie or what have you. So, yeah, would you agree that that a lot of these things will change as they become more democratic? I think so. I mean, clearly part of that as well is fashion, which is adjacent to what we're talking about with luxury and prestige, but it's it's not necessarily, you know, it's got some overlap on the Venn diagram, but it, it's got its own rules as well. And um, it's funny, I, I did a lot of, I, I was going to write a chapter about fashion and it just felt so big and beyond me at that point, I, I, I didn't do it. But um, I think there's something to consider there in, in terms of what we're talking about with the counter signaling of clothes. But that, that, definitely, that definitely goes on. I mean, it, it's an it's a identified trend. Yeah. Uh, here's another question. Did any race car drivers threaten you? <laughs> no race car drivers threatened me. I'm not sure if there's something I need to know about that. When I did go <laughs> over to the, um, the car plant in Italy to interview Paolo Scudieri, they have a, a lot of um, race cars there on the premises. And they have a track, test track. And I really thought I was going to get a check. I thought they would, you know, when you go do this as a journalist, sometimes you get a little perk, like, hey, you want to go take out the, you know, the race car? I get trying to think of a name of it, but I'm not a car guy. They had a bunch and just, you know, whip around the track and stuff. And I really thought I might get a chance to do that. But, but now, how about, did you get any swag writing this book? No, I didn't at all. I paid for everything. 100%. You are an honest, honest man, Chuck. I've taken swag. You know what? That's not true. I did take one. I did spend one free night at a very super luxury hotel, um, but that's it. And I didn't take anything else around that. Um, but I have taken plenty of swag in my life. I know that how that works. And I, you know, I, I've, I never do that when I'm writing books. Uh huh. I see. But I woke up that one night. It was probably about a five hundred dollar night hotel. Um, I wondered. Is the this is this will show you how profound a thinker I am. Is the color of your book meant to put in our minds the boxes from the jewel company Tiffany's? You know, I have to say, <clears throat> I didn't choose that color, and I didn't. Uh, yeah, it is Tiffany blue, and somebody said that to me after they saw it. I had not thought of it that way, but I do know that color. I think we all kind of do. And 
if the designer, if that was the designer's intention, then I say great. But um, I don't think it was, yeah, I'll tell you, since we're here, I'll tell you a real quick story. There was the first iteration of this cover, the baseball cap that's attached to the crown, the king or queen's crown is blue. In the artist's original design, it was red and it looked really cool and I liked it, but th there was a thought that it was gonna um, impart a sense of MAGA red on a hat. And so <laughs> it was taken away. So that's when the colors changed. So I think it's just a happy coincidence, but you know, maybe the designer did do that with Tiffany blue. I should ask. Cause I agree yeah. with you. Yeah, I was- And, and I, bet we're not, I, I bet we're not even supposed to say the T word because oh. yeah, there's, it, there's, there might be some legal yeah, well, they probably they don't own that. It's certainly that word. Those two those two words have come together, but they certainly don't own that color. Well, maybe they do. Christ, I don't know. Maybe they. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the Pantone or Sherman Williams people. <laughs> um, let's see. Other question. So here's someone responding. See if this makes sense. Uh, but I would argue that female domination lowers the status of the organization or academic department. Think of elementary teaching or nursing. Well, I wouldn't argue that at all. I would argue that any women that are in uh, positions of professional power uh, elevates the status of that person or the group that they identify with. One uh, woman that I write about in the book is Ethel Percy Andrus, who uh, in addition to um, being the first woman who was principal of a major high school in California, which was Abraham Lincoln High School in Los Angeles, I see she got her principalship there in the 1920s, went on to found AARP. Um, and <clears throat> she was a, just amazing. She, her idea of status was to, she really wanted to elevate, the reason AARP got off the ground was as an insurance company, but she felt that retired teachers and, and older people, people over 50 in general, did not enjoy a level of status in society, uh, legal status and, and health protection, things like that, that they deserved. And so she said about, she started the Association for the Advancement of Retired People, which is now officially called the AARP, to combat that and to raise the, elevate the status of older Americans. And she did it quite successfully. She's a, right. she's a good story. And she's one of those unknown stories that I really liked writing about in this book, because not a lot of people know who Ethel Percy Andrus is. If you go down to the University of Southern California, you'll find her name on a couple of buildings, a gerontology research center, and things like that. But um, yeah, she started AARP. And I, I wouldn't argue that um, her um, dominating that profession lowered her status one bit. Um, yeah, it's interesting in this conversation about philanthropy, um, I was just reading about how David Geffen gave a huge behest, bequest to Yale Drama School such that no, um, no Yale Drama student, again, ever has to pay tuition. Do you, is that a different impulse, do you think, from the person who wants his name on a building? It, it, to me, it feels a little more insidious or yeah, it's, it's, it's direct. Philanthropy is kind of interesting because even if, it's, even if it's just me donating $50 to a cause, in some ways I'm being altruistic, I'm giving some money, something, but in some ways I'm trying to make myself feel better, right? Am I trying to assuage some guilt or something that I might have or just feel like, oh, I'm a good person, you know, and this shows it. And my taxes now reflect that too. I, I think it's a mixed bag, Henry, I really do. I really spent a lot of time thinking about and talking to people about impulses for altruism. I think the thing that I would say there again is that it, it dovetails into what we were talking about with, he gets to decide right, that, that the, the money that might otherwise have gone as tax dollars into the American coffers to either do whatever, buy bullets, build roads, um, uh, fund a uh, head start, he's gonna decide now. And I'm gonna, he's going to put it in a very elite spot and make sure that that Yale University doesn't suffer in its endowment because Stanford and Harvard are, are kind of getting some room against Yale, right? So it's like, let's, let, that's what that's about. And that's, again, what, what it's about, you know, maintaining that, that level of status. Hey, real quick to go back, maybe the question about um, women that are mostly elementary school teachers is tied to the fact that, I mean, children, small children have less status. I mean, what kind of status does a seven-year-old child have in this society? Not much. 
Um, they have very few legal rights and they were hauling guns into their classrooms. So it's not like they've got much status. So maybe the fact is it's so much that women dominating elementary school lowers their status. It's just that those kids have low status in the first place. I don't know. That's probably one of those ideas that I should think through before I talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love it when you're off the cuff. <laughs> Um, hey, Stick around. I will say something stupid eventually, trust me. <laughs> so I see that it is 802. Um, does Omar, Armoire, are you going to come back on and lead us gently on into the night? Yes, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> um, great conversation. This is definitely something in my wheelhouse, thinking about status and class. It's always something that's on my mind. Um, so if you want to buy Chuck's book, um, you can do so through our museum store. Um, I put the link in the chat a few times. Um, if, uh, if you missed it, uh, just scroll up into the chat. You can also go onto our shop on our website and it'll be there. Um, and uh, Thanks so much to Chuck and Henry for this uh, wonderful conversation. <laughs> um, and thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, if you want to join us on some future programs, um, if you're interested in history, you can join us virtually for State on Freedom with Dan Berger and Christina Greer on Tuesday, January 31st at 7. And if you're interested in a little bit of humor, you can join us in person if you're within driving distance. Uh, for You Are My Sunshine with Sean Dietrich, also known as Sean of the South, on Tuesday, February 14th at 6, a little Valentine's Day um, program there. Um, and yes, buy um, Chuck's book. Um, I'll hold it up again here. Um, kind of can't see, there it goes, yeah. <laughs> um, in the blue that shall not be named. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, Henry, as well. And everybody that attended, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, you guys.